You're listening to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Big John McCarthy has witnessed the best that the UFC had to offer. That is it! Game, set, back! We have a new champion! Your backstage pass to the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Let's get it on! Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and me, Sean Wheelock. Every week on this podcast, John and I give you an inside look at MMA and combat sports, always separating fact from fiction. On this week's program, we'll be speaking exclusively and in-depth with one of the true greats in mixed martial arts, the natural Randy Couture. Plus, John and I will discuss the verbal submission heard round the MMA world, Joe Warren versus Marcos Galvan at last week's Bellator 135, which John refereed and I commentated. And as we do on every single episode of Let's Get It On, John will answer your questions, ask away via email, info at let's get it on podcast.com. That's info at let's get it on podcast.com. Remember that you can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can listen straight on our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. Well, John, it's funny how things sometimes work out because last week on this very podcast, you and I spoke extensively on verbal submissions, including the scream of pain. (laughs) We had on our Karnak the the magnificent hat like Johnny Carson. (laughs) That was a... It was kind of funny, you know. If you want to look at, you know, almost foreshadowing, look at the poster. The poster is perfect. <laughs> it's got Marcus Galvaus, you know, looking straight at Joe, and Joe screaming out, you know, like he's mad at him. But I mean, it's amazing how some things happen. But you know what? It's just part of the sport, and that's what makes this sport phenomenal. Let's take you back now to the main event of last week's Bellator 135. This is how Jimmy Smith and I called the end of the fight on Spike. <laughs> John, who always has your back, brother. See, right to the world, I said live on Spike. Look, I, I've known you a long time. You and me are close friends, and you said it emphatically last week on Let's Get It On. You mentioned this very thing in every single one of your fighter meetings, be it for a world title, as this fight was in Bellator, or if you had a couple of AMI debuters. Absolutely. You know, this is what people think, you know, when we talk about things in the back, everyone's got this idea that we're just going over, okay, don't grab the fence, don't pull hair, don't, you know, grab the clap, you know, that's not what we're doing. And obviously, we go over the fouls that possibly going to happen more often than others, but we talk about the bout conduct, and we talk about what I'm going to say to him, and what it means to him, and then what I am going to allow him to do, what I'm going to allow him to go to certain points. And when we talk about submissions, I tell them that, you know, hey, I'm going to let you go and work your way out of any submission you get caught in, but do not let it get to the point where we have damage. And damage is two things. You get a lot of people complaining about, you know, certain stoppages or non-stoppages because someone's elbow is hyperextending, we'll say, or their knee is hyperextending. Well, if his knee is hyperextending and he's not screaming out in pain and he's not tapping, we're going to let it go. And I'll let it go to the point where I see it actually have damage, meaning... It's a dislocation or a break. We have those. The fight's over. They know they've been told in the back. You know, the fight's going to end. You're going to get a long medical suspension. Don't let that happen. Let me get you out of the fight. But we do that. Tell them as far as you know, screaming. And I, I try to use some humor when I do it. Is you know, I t- I'll tell them you know, if you know you get caught in a submission and you need to summon the gods of retard strength to get yourself out, and you grunt, you groan, you moan, I will not stop the fight. But if you scream out in pain like you're a 12 year old girl is usually what I'll say yeah. and you're telling me that you have become overwhelmed with the submission the fight is over you lost and that was told to Joe and, you know, and obviously you know at the heat of the moment when it happens and I stop the fight you know Joe's looking at it it's everything is good once the hold is released because the pain's gone you know and at that point he is good to go but we have to look at the, the true meaning of our sport is it's a sport. This is not about, you know, anger or anything like that. This is about competition and when it's it's chess 
And Joe got put into a submission. That thing was deep. It was on good. That's why I'm standing over the way I'm going, oh, you're not getting out of that because he wasn't doing the right things to get out of it. And when I'm looking at it and then all of a sudden he screams out, that scream is saying that, you know, I have become overwhelmed. I can't get myself out and my joint is going and that's why he screamed out pain and that's understandable. I don't, you know, uh, I don't look bad at Joe Horn for that. I had a scream, you know. Most people were going to scream on that. That was a painful submission. You know, my knees are so bad. As soon as someone grabs me, I'm tapping. I'm getting out of there. So he put up with a whole lot more than I would have. But we really, our job is the safety of the fighters. And you know, you're going to get people saying, "Oh, it doesn't matter if he screams. You know what? You should let him go." And, you know, look at this is about protecting fighters, and and we, you know, look at this as close as we can, and we let them go as far as we can. But when they, we have that scream, we've told. You know, every fighter that I work with gets told the fight's coming to an end. John, we talked about it last week, and we recorded our podcast last week. It drops on Fridays, but we recorded on Thursday night. It's just, again, weird how the world works out. But a point we made, and I think it's worth reiterating here, doesn't matter if the scream is voluntary or involuntary. Clearly with Joe Warren, it was involuntary. Yeah. You, under the unified rules as a referee, you have no discretion. You have to stop it. No more than in the NFL, if somebody kicks a chip shot field goal, the officials can confer and say, yeah, that wasn't very tough. We'll only give it two points. That's not the way it works, <laughs> and that's not the way it works in MMA. No. You know, look, you, you've got to go with the standard, and the standard is, you know, if they scream out intentionally, it's telling you, you know, I'm hurt. They scream out involuntarily. They're telling you, I'm hurt. And you know, this is just, there's got to be a barometer for the officials to look and say, this is a sign that you have become overwhelmed in the fight and I'm going to get you out of the fight. It's no, it's really no different than any other type of you know, situation where a fighter gets overwhelmed. You know, a fighter can get punched and get hurt and they go down and then they start to cover up and then they get overwhelmed and they start putting both hands to one side of their head and the guy's sitting there, you know, throwing shots. And we stop the fight based on the fact that the fighter's not intelligently defending themselves. And as soon as we stop it, the blows have stopped. And so the guy can, you know, sit up now and go, I'm okay. No, you're not okay because you did what we told you in the back we can't have. And that's part of the communication we have. That's why we do have rules meetings. We want fighters to ask questions. We want them to know exactly what we expect of them and what they can expect of us, what we are going to do in given situations. And on that night, the fighters both knew it. You know, Marcus Galvao knew it. He's, you know, I'll give Marcus credit. You know, I was there, I think, fairly fast to stop that when he screamed out. And if you slow that fight down you know, and go into slow motion, Marcus does that little jerk to try to put more pressure on it, and he's looking at Joe Warren, and when Joe Warren screams out, Marcus Galvao starts to let go. He's yep. letting go before my hands touch it, and that's releasing that. Because he's a, he, John, he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, a high-level black belt, and he's done that a million times in training on the mat in the gym, and he knows that's the right thing to do. You release at that at that point of the scream. Absolutely. He's a, you know, look at He's a competitor. He's a, he's a He's a classy, you know, athlete. He's a sportsman, and he knows that. Hey, I just put you in checkmate. That's it. It's over. You know, and he heard the same thing, you know, from me in his locker room before that fight. Of the same thing about the screen. So when he heard it, you know, that's over. And he started actually letting go of that thing even before my hands went down to break it. So you know, you got to give credit to Marcus Gabriel for being a classy athlete. I really like Joe Warren. I consider him a good friend. I've been I out love with him Joe socially. Joe Warren, he's a great guy. Oh my God, he's an outstanding competitor. He's a great personality. He's everything that you want. If you're Bellator, he brings excitement. He's fun. People, you know, it's okay if someone doesn't like him. You know, people are going to watch him to for people that love his you know personality to watch him to win. And there's people that watch him to lose because they think I want him to get his mouth you know closed. Okay, but Joe Warren's a great guy. Yeah, and you know, in, in, in Joe Warren, Jason Mayhem Miller, Chael Sonnen, King Mo Lawal, those types of fighters, people either love them or they hate them, but nobody ignores them. And I bring this up because you and I both like Joe Warren a lot. You and me both have to be neutral, totally neutral, don't care who wins, don't care who loses, but we can still have personal relationships. I certainly do as a commentator with some fighters. All that being said on Joe, 
he's getting murdered online, and I think unfairly because of this scream. And I know when you say you're the baddest man on the planet and you have the trash talking and the swagger of Joe Warren, you probably bring that upon yourself. You probably invite that. But anybody who's criticizing him, saying he's less than a man or less than a champion for screaming, has never been caught in a deep knee bar. They've probably never been on a mat in their life. That's just my personal perspective. It hurts. Jimmy Smith was showing me his knee bar one time. I didn't scream, but it definitely got my attention. And I think I'm very flexible. And I thought my kneecap was going to fall off. It's pain like you generally don't feel in life. Oh, it, it's it, a, a good knee bar, especially when you know when you when you're watching it. You know, I'm looking to see is Joe doing the right things to get out. And you know, I'm being honest. You know, he wasn't. Got, it got caught so deep and. He was doing the right things as they were scrambling. He's trying to figure for his leg. He was doing a lot of things that, you know, hey, that's what I would want to see. And then as soon as they made that spin around and, Mar and Marcus had it, it was deep and he's got it. And you see Joe's hand staying almost in the same place. His foot, his other foot doesn't come up to try to push up. He can't. He's stuck. And, you know, look at a knee bar. I don't care, you know, what anyone wants to say. Heel hooks are damaging, but they don't hurt until all of a sudden there's a pop. Knee bars hurt from the moment of pressure. And they hurt horribly because your knee is getting pushed in the opposite direction of the way God intended it to go. And you know, any, you know, anybody can say what they want. And you know, they cannot, like Joe Warren, they can you know, sit there and say bad things about him. Joe Warren has proved himself to be one hell of a competitor throughout his career, be it in wrestling or in MMA. And he has nothing to uh, prove to anybody. He has nothing to apologize for. He goes out, he puts on a performance, he puts out, you know, you know, in, in the uh, build up to the fight, he does a great job of doing things to say, I'm the fattest man on the planet. That's awesome. Let him, you know, hey, if that's what, he, you know, that's what the way he thinks about himself, that's great. What's wrong with it? You know, if he believes he's the baddest man on the planet, now there's always going to be something that's going to prove him wrong. That's okay. But it doesn't mean there's anything bad with it. Joe Warren, is everything that you want to see if you're a promoter. He comes to fight, he promotes the fight, he builds it, you know, Marcus Galbao said it even in the ring, you know what, you know, Joe Ward's a good guy, you know, he's just building the fight. And that's what he's doing, and people don't understand it, they get, they get too personally invested in it, and then when, you know, when the person on top falls, which is what everyone wants to see, then they're, they're quick to sit there and try to, you know, throw stones down at him as he's falling down the hill, you know, that's, that's just people, and it's ridiculous. Joe Warren is a great guy. He's a great competitor, and people should understand that. You know what? He takes it serious, and you know he was devastated in losing that belt, and that to me only makes me like him more. Yeah, I fully concur on Joe Warren, and while he's taking a lot of heat, John, I think with the exception of a couple of random cranks, which are gunning for all of us, <laughs> I think uh, the, the fans, certainly the MMA media, have come down firmly on your side, and uh, again, because there's literally no discretion. Everyone has a story. I heard a fighter scream and the referee didn't stop. Up it. The referee made a mistake. I'm going to exactly. quote now from the Unified Rules of the ABC. The, here, here's a verbatim quote now, again, from the Unified Rules of the ABC, their website. It's not, it's not viewer friendly. You have to do your work, but it's abcboxing.com. You can find it. They don't do a great job of putting the Unified Rules out there. You have to search around, but you will find it. All right, again, I'm quoting now. Verbal tap out. When a contestant verbally announces to the referee that he or she does not wish to continue or makes audible sounds such as screams indicating pain or discomfort. Again, that's definitive. That's pretty definitive. You know, and, and look at it. If there's anything I can say about the whole thing, you know, I did my job the way I'm supposed to do it. If someone doesn't like it, that's okay. You know, you could not like it, but there are rules within the NFL that people don't like, and the referee's going to not sit there and side with, uh, I'm going to go with the fans walk. They're going to go with what the rule is. That's their job. You know, out of all of it, you know, I wouldn't change anything I did. If there was one thing that I could change that I think would have helped, you know, Joe in the end, is I think Joe, at the end of it, people want to see him being a sportsman. And they want to see him shake Marcus Galbao's hand. They want to see him stand there at the end like, you know, other people have done when he has won and show the respect that is needed towards Marcus because Marcus did a great job. He went out there and he did what, other people have not been able to do the joke, and you've got to give them this props for it. And I think if there was one thing that if I could change anything with the whole thing, it would be 
I would like to see Joe show the respect to Marcus because I think that would have helped with the fans. Every week here on Let's Get It On, we bring you a poll question. You can cast your vote on our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. So this week's poll question, do you feel that it should be a rule that a scream of pain, which of course it is a rule, but do you feel that it should in fact be a rule that a scream of pain constitutes a verbal submission or do you think that the referee should allow it to go? Let us know what you think. Always interested in how you vote on our polls. So let us, Let's get let it us on know if you're sadistic or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee you, John, a lot of people are going to say, no, it's not up to the referee. The fighter can yeah. tap. And we talked about last week, you know, when I was in Pride and I called uh, uh, Shinya Aoki versus Brian Lowe and you, he screamed the referee did not stop it. Again, Japanese MMA isn't then, and it's certainly in, 2000, in 2006, 2007, wasn't under the unified rules. But... Brian Lowenew was caught in a double arm bar. He couldn't have tapped had he wanted to. Fighters can't always tap. Joe Warren could have tapped in that situation. Sure. It flirted out. But fighters can't always tap in a situation you know, where they're caught. Again, this is a sport. And you know what? You can lose in sport. And if you get caught in that situation where you end up doing one of the things that we've told you, okay, you can't let it get to this point, and you do it and you lose, that's just part of the sport. But we, we would rather have it where the fighter screams out pain and is able to come back again another day and not go through surgery and not have all these you know, you know, medical problems because of the fact that we decide, okay, we're not going to stop it on the screen, and his knee gets exploded backwards, all the, all the tendons and ligaments tear, the cartilage is torn out, and Joe Warren never walks the same. He never is able to come back and compete at the level that he was before. That's ridiculous. That's why we have it. John, back in the early days of the UFC, and I think many people, if not most, who are listening to this podcast know you started refereeing at UFC 2. But in the early days when you and Art Davey were pretty much making this up event to event as you guys went along, what if that identical situation happened, say, in UFC 4 when – Everything wasn't laid out. There was no such thing as the unified rules. There was no governing body. What states that did have athletic commissions were worried about kickboxing and boxing. You were left alone. What would you have done in that situation? Say this was UFC 4. You know, I'm being honest. If it was UFC 2, I think I would have stood there and just let it go because that was the whole thing. You know, back then it was Horian who decided either the fighter taps out or the corner throws in the towel. Other than that, we do not. I don't want you stopping the fight. And that's when, you know, I did that. I really did that for you know, UFC 2, and it was horrible. It was absolutely one of the worst experiences of my life. I, I can't stand it. And by UFC 3, I had gotten to the point where I had come up with that the fighter could not intelligently defend themselves. I was going to be able to stop the fight. And that was there at UFC 4. And in my opinion, when a fighter is screaming out in pain, they are they can't intelligently defend themselves. They become overwhelmed. So I'm thinking, honestly, at UFC 4, I'd have stopped it. At UFC 2, I wouldn't. Can you imagine the booze that would have rained oh, down on you at UFC i I'm used to booze. It's four. okay. I got booze for two quarters. <laughs> <laughs> you did, actually. That's Absolutely. true. Absolutely. That's okay. You know, look at uh, Again, you know, I'm not there to, to be popular. You know, if people like me, that's awesome. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. If they don't like me, that's awesome. No problem. It doesn't bother me. You know, I'm not there to be popular. I'm there to protect the fighter. And if you look at, you know, that fight, that's really what I'm doing. You know, and I want, you know, Joe Warren actually tweeted me, you know, a response, you know, uh, I want to say a day after the fight. And he says, you know, hey, John, I watched the fight. I understand. Thank you for protecting me. And you know what? That says everything you need to know about Joe Warren. And it's, look, it's the competitor in that wants him to go on. I'm okay. And when he, he goes back and he watches it, you know, he understands. And you know what? He's going to come back a better fighter. And uh, you know, it, it's tough. When you're, when you're the champion and you lose that belt, there's a lot that goes with that belt. And some of it's good. Some of it's bad. But, you know, there's a pride factor that people, most people will never understand because they don't put in the work and sacrifice it takes to attain that belt. They don't understand it. That's what you were saying.
John, final point on this. Let's talk again about what you do in your rules meeting, in your fighter meeting. Sometimes they're one-on-one. Depends on the promotion. Depends on the location. Sometimes it's a group. But a lot of referees, high-level, mid-level, beginners, listen to this podcast. Just walk through the procedure. And when you're instructing referees, regardless of their level, because, again, you're, you're not saying – all right, no fish hooking, no eye gouging, no hair pulling. You're talking about the subtleties, the gray areas, the nuances. Yeah, well, I mean, it would be, we don't have enough time right now for me to go through an actual rules meeting that I would have with a fighter because it does take time. And it really depends on, you know, who the fighter is. If I've worked with them, how many times I've worked with them will depend on how much, you know, I have to go over again and stuff. And, I'll, you know, if I've worked with someone, you know, 10 times, I'll say, okay, you recall what I do, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. And I'll go over certain situations. And the one thing you know, that we really you know, try to explain to the fighters is, first off, I'm not going to talk to you in a way that you have to answer me. I will make statements to you. In those statements, this is what it means. And I will sit there and say, when I say this, this is what it means. And so they understand it. The fans might not understand it, but the fighter understands it. Um, I'm going to tell them you know, things about when they're going to be able to, you know, uh, if, if they knock their opponent down, what I expect of them. If they want to keep the fighter down, they're going to stay pressed up on him, and I will give them time to work. If they want him up, step back away from your opponent, and he has to get up. We will come in between you, and automatically we're going to make him get up, and you're in control of the position. When it comes to you know, being a down fighter, what we're looking for, if you take the fight to the ground, this is what I expect you to do. This is what I'm looking for. If you don't, this is what's going to happen. If you're the bottom fighter and you, you know, close your guard and you grab a hold of your opponent, you can do that. You can do that to defend yourself, but understand you're the fighter stalling my fight, and I'm never going to stand you up. You're the one stalling it. If you want me to think about standing the fight up, I need you to open your guard and attack your opponent. Make him on top start to stall. That's when you'll get the fight stood up quicker. If you get hurt, we're going to go over things about when you get hurt, what I expect of you. Fighters know when we're going to stop the fight. Now, sometimes they don't because they've been hurt so bad that you know, they can't remember their middle name right now. But they know when we're going to stop the fight because we've gone over the situation. They know what I'm going to say to them. They know what they need to do when I say it, so I will let the fight go on. And these are all of the things that we go in as far as the bout conduct. What is being said, what it means to them, and what they need to do to respond in a way that the fight's going to continue on. So there's a ton that goes on with it, and everyone's going to have their own style for doing it, but it's a matter of communicating with the fighter so there's no doubts about things when they happen out there. It's the same as, you know, you look at the situation. What I did in the back set me up to be successful in the ring, because not because, you know, everyone liked it, but Joe was told exactly what was going to be done in a given situation, and it was done. You know, there was there was no variance of it, and that's what makes you successful as a referee. When you do those things in the back and you communicate it, and then it happens in the ring, you have a structure to stand on, saying, "What did I tell you in the back?" And that's part of what you know our job is. John and I definitely always want to hear from you, answer your questions every week on this podcast. So fire away. Submit your questions via email, info at let's get it on podcast.com, info at let's get it on podcast.com. We've received a large vo- number, a high volume of outstanding questions. We only can get to two or three every podcast, but hang in there, keep them coming. Outstanding questions coming in from around the world. And I will tell you, as an MMA television commentator who once called Agidius Velavichus versus Atenas Jambazov, you know that I'm very <laughs> big on saying names correctly. So please, please, please include instructions on. On pronunciation. Again, email your questions info at let's get it on podcast.com. First up, John, it's an easy name, Douglas Hill. My question involves the excellent Bellator match, same card, Bellator 135, between LC Davis and Hideo Tokoro. During the match, LC was hit with what appeared to me to be a legal upkick that landed. Referee Jason Herzog stopped the action and gave LC some time to regroup. John, was this an error on his part? Why was this done? Well, Let's take a look at the situation. You know, first thing I'm going to say is Jason Herzog is an outstanding referee. I love Jason. Jason is fully agreed. And you know the thing is, you know, I make fun of him for certain things. You know that's that's just between us. And, you know he knows what it does and stuff. But 
Jason absolutely has one of the essential things as far as being a referee is Jason understands when fighters are hurt. Jason understands when he needs to get them out. And Jason does such an outstanding job uh, all the time that I'm proud to be able to work with him. Uh, the whole thing that happened with Elsie and Takoro, you're talking about a split second decision on Jason's part in that he's looking at Takoro being on the ground, he sees Elsie Davis coming down, and at the angle that he sees the action, he believes it as Takoro is on his back and Elsie's coming down, Takoro throws a kick and Elsie's knee touches the ground, and then the kick hits him in the face. So he made a stop of the action on what he believed was an illegal up, a legal kick to a grounded fighter. Now, he didn't believe that it was an intentional act as far as Takoro doing it, knowing that Elsie was down. He thought Takoro looked at it like Elsie's up, and so he's doing it intentionally, but it wasn't an intentional kick of a down fight. So Jason's you know, idea was to stop the action, to see if Elsie was okay, and then to try to get the you know, action going again once he got an okay from Elsie saying that, you know what, he, he was okay. Well, Jason, as you know, the fight you know, is being held up, he sees on the replay up on the screen, he sees that the kick was actually thrown before the knee touched the ground. It doesn't matter if the knee touches the ground before the kick touches the face. It's a matter of, was the kick thrown before the knee was on the ground? Then it makes it a legal knee. And he sees that. John, it, Go ahead. John, it's similar to, did a strike land legally at the end of a round when the bell sounds, yeah, when the I mean, horn blows? Yeah, the, you know, because it lands doesn't mean that it's bad. It's when was it thrown and where was the position of the opponent when it was done. This is where a lot of people get confused, like with a down fighter with a knee to the head. You're going to see fighters putting their hands down, and they put their hand down, and they pick their hand up, and then all of a sudden they're trying to throw their hand back down the ground because they see a knee coming. And it doesn't matter if your hand hits the ground first before the knee hits them. The knee is legal. And we'll get a lot of people that will watch the replay say, his hand's on the ground. No, the knee was thrown while the hand was in the air. It's a legal knee. And this is what happened with Takoro and stuff. I, and Jason kind of saw it and tried to, to race LC back and say, hey, you know what, I'm seeing it's clean. And I honestly believe, and I told Jason when he came out of the ring, hey, you could have called that either way and you were going to be okay. It was that close. And, you know, look at we're human. You know, we're never going to be perfect. We can only do things to the best of our ability and towards leaning towards the safety of the fighters, and that's what Jason did. And I have no problem with what Jason did. I think he's an unbelievable official, and I'm, again, I'm proud to be able to work with him. By the way, that's the referee my wife always says, oh, that's the good-looking one. Sean. Yeah, I hate him for that. Th there you go. <laughs> Son of a bitch is too pretty. <laughs> Next up, John, U.S. Army Specialist Thomas Maroon, who's stationed at Rose Barracks in Vilsack, Germany. Thomas asks, John, do you think performance-enhancing drugs and testosterone replacement therapy should be legalized for medical use with strict guidelines in place? No. You know what? And this is why. Fighting is not a right. It's a privilege. To be part of our sport is a privilege. And, and there's things that have now. When I say no, there's always going to be something that I could sit there and say, yes, there's a variance for that. You know, let's, let's just say, you know, God, I know this is kind of wacky to say, let's say we had a veteran from the armed forces who ended up, you know, uh, being injured, you know, we'll say with an IED and had, you know, uh, as simple as I can say, had his, you know, his testicles, you know, removed based upon that explosive device going off near him and leaves the military and picks up fighting and decides, I want to fight, but is on a you know, hormone replacement therapy as far as he's getting testosterone uh, via an outside source instead of via you know, what naturally would have happened if he was you know, the same person he was when he was born. That's a variance where I could understand, yes, we, we need a variance for this person. He should be able to take something to bring himself to a norm. But when it comes to everything else, you know, unless it's something like that, again, fighting is not a right. It's a privilege. And when we have certain fighters who 
do things, they do things wrong, and, and there's a lot of things that happen you know, when they don't do them wrong. We, we have learned that through head trauma, we can actually have a reduction in our testosterone levels. And through more head trauma, we get a greater you know, reduction. And those are fighters sometimes that are sitting there wanting to take you know, a testosterone to bring themselves back up to a norm. Well, I think, you know, naturally, you know, I don't know, you know if you want to say it's nature or God or someone's telling them it's coming to an end. You know, to sit there and to allow them to start to boost their levels back up when they're losing it because they're taking headshots. Well, you know what? Maybe it's, it's time just to put an end to this and say, you know, my fighting career is over. If you're someone that has been on, uh, you know, some type of steroid it's going to alter your levels too, and many times people come out with lower levels because of it. Well, that's your fault for taking it in the first place, and you know what? You don't get to bump it up now to try to make it normal because you did something that was illegal in the beginning. It's just, you know, it's not smart. It causes problems for everyone in the sport. We need to clean things up to the point where if you are someone like I stated, you know, the military person who has had an injury or you've had testicular cancer and had to have, you know, things removed, and it's, that is your only way, I can understand there being a, a use exemption. Other than that, I don't see it, I don't think it's right, and we need to stop trying to uh, make people feel good by using something that is absolutely performance enhancing, there's no other way to look at it, and if you have, you know, what you were born with, and it's not producing enough at this point in your life, that's just too bad, don't be a fighter. Keep your outstanding questions coming. Again, we definitely want to hear from you. Ask away whatever you'd like. Info at Let's Get It On Podcast.com. Still to come on this week's episode of Let's Get It On, John and I are joined by the former UFC light heavyweight and heavyweight champion and truly one of the best people in all of combat sports, Randy Couture. With Big John McCarthy, I'm Sean Wheelock. You're listening to Let's Get It On. Friday, April 10th, Bellator MMA, presented by Miller Lite, returns to the Brand Event Center. Unbelievable! Lightweight world champion, Bill Will Brooks, defends his belt Whoa! when he takes on Dave, the fugitive Jensen, plus a middleweight slugfest. Oh my god! As Joe stitch him up chilling, battles Rafael Carvalho. Live from the Brand Event Center, Friday, April 10th. Get your tickets now at the box office, ucirvine.com or bellator.com. For all of our listeners looking for great new designs in MMA apparel, look to the new clothing styles of Lambs to Lions. That's right, Lambs to Lions has got new styles with old and new put together. Boxing, MMA, everything. Go to lambstolionsbrand.com and check out their line of clothing. It's the book that Wrestling Observer calls a must-read for any MMA fan. Jonathan Snowden of Bleacher Report describes as riveting and amazing, and the fightner.com says nothing is held back. Pick this book up right away. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It, written by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the foreword by John McCarthy, is now available to listeners of this podcast at the special price of $12.48. That's far less than you'll pay for the book on Amazon and half price of what you'll pay in store at Barnes & Noble. Buy it directly from the publisher now online at ascendbooks.com and enter the promo code LEGAL50. That's A-S-C-E-N-D books.com, promo code LEGAL50. Learn the true story of how the UFC came into existence in the book that Randy Couture describes as honest, shocking, and enthralling, and that has a rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars from Amazon Reader Reviews. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the forward by Big John McCarthy. Available now online at ascendbooks.com for just $12.48 when you use the promo code LEGAL50. Hey, this is Sean Wheelock. And this is Big John McCarthy. If you're a fan of our show, then you're going to love the rest of the Ignotainment podcast lineup. Like the Ocho Man behind the eight ball and the Whiskey Philosopher with Jeff Cooper. You can find these great podcasts and more at Ignotainment.com. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the program. Let's get it on!
Now, back to Let's Get It On with your hosts, Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Last Friday night at Bellator 135, Ryan Couture defeated Dakota Cochran by first round submission. In Ryan Couture's corner was his dad, the natural Randy Couture. Following the night's fights, John and I spoke exclusively for this podcast with the former UFC light heavyweight and heavyweight champion, and I began our interview by asking Randy about the emotions of cornering his son Ryan in MMA as opposed to fighting himself. Well, it's something that started for us uh, a long time ago in wrestling, and I got way more nervous watching him step out on the mat and wrestle through through junior high and high school, and we kind of came up with a way to, to deal with, you know, him dragging around the same last name in, in that sport that, that I'd been fairly accomplished in and, and now it's transitioned to fighting and so the same thing I, I try to stay out of his way and uh, he comes to me and asks me for help I, I don't offer it unless he asks for it and but I see him at the gym I know he's prepared I've been doing this a long time I've never seen anybody seriously injured so I, I'm not nervous like that but there's always that loss of control you know, you see things in the, with any fighter that I'm coaching. It's like you want them to do well. You have a vested interest in, in, in their experience and what they're doing. So uh, there's that. It, it's that kind of nerves. It's not the, not the kind of the dad kind of nerves. It's different. You are such a liar. Okay, you are lying. I'm telling you he's lying, okay? This is about talking to – look at There's nothing worse than being a trainer in the fact that when the fighter goes out there, you have no control. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what's so bad. And then when on top of that, when it's your son, it makes it even worse. You know it makes it worse. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you over it. I don't, I don't feel worse about it. No. I mean, you know, again. The, the one thing that you've got to give, and you know, the thing about Ryan that is so amazing to me is he has picked up your – your ability, and, and, and he's done it at a younger age, I'm being honest with it, <laughs> is that he has got that calmness about him that he doesn't get overly excited or amped about the fight. He's very calm and he's very methodical and very you know, intelligent in the way he goes about doing the fight. He doesn't worry about bad positions. If he gets himself in a he just calmly starts to work his way out. And he has accepted the fact that, you know, in, in my way of looking at it, hey, it's a fight. I know how to fight. And I'm going to be okay. And if, if in the end that I don't win this fight, it ain't going to be the worst thing in my life. And I think he got a lot of that from you. But he does it at a, at a time that, you know what, he does it at a point in his life that it's hard for guys to understand that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with your perspective on that. And, and I've stated that many times. If, if the worst thing that ever happens to you in your life is you lose a fight, you're doing pretty damn good. Okay. And, and I think he does – well, I mean, it's – kind of scary he has a lot of the same traits characteristics a lot of people mistaken his voice for mine and you know my my girlfriend thought it was me in 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 the house and left the bathroom door open and it, that's troubling it was it was ryan <laughs> you know what, what side you're, you're on how what, troubling that what is scene cannot have, be unseen have you seen his girlfriend i have okay ryan's a lucky guy <laughs> <laughs> Randy, with the calmness, with the demeanor, one thing that I've noticed being an MMA commentator, Jimmy Smith and I talk about this a lot on the Bellator broadcast, guys who come out of NCAA Division I wrestling programs such as yourself understand competition, winning and losing, just the repetition of competition that you're going to lose and you're going to be right back on the mat. And it seems like that mindset has transcended over into MMA for a lot of high-level college wrestlers. I think that's a great foundation, competitive, both technically and tactically, and the, and the mindset of a wrestler is great, translates to MMA, and I think you're right. I've walked out on that mat and had my butt kicked on many occasions, and, and the sun came up the next day, and I was back at it the next weekend, and, and it puts a different perspective in your mind about winning and losing. We hate to lose. We're going to do whatever we can do not to experience that, but we also know it's not the end of the world, and, and I think that wrestlers have a particular mindset. Every single day I was in there on that mat scrapping with some of my best friends, to this day some of my best friends, and one of us is going home pissed off that day. It, it got taken down, I got scored on, I, I lost that damn match, you know, uh, and, and you're back at it again the next day and the next week and, and on and on and on. So 
it, it's just a different mindset completely than I think any other martial art, to be honest. You know, the, the one thing that you know, I look at is you showed throughout your career how, you know, cerebral you were with your fighting. And it really, that's what it was. And you won many of your fights by being someone that mentally broke other fighters just by your persistence in the way you did things and how you would make them fight your fight instead of them being able to fight their fight. And I think the one thing that I'm getting out of Ryan, Ryan really started as a jiu-jitsu kind of guy, not really a wrestling guy, but he has really taken his wrestling. And you see him with, I see him doing the same things you did. I, and I know that you've been, you know, he's been working it. And it's amazing for me to see the, the, the transformation. The one thing you know, I'll give Ryan is, Ryan's a better submission guy than you than you were. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. You know, he's just he's smoother in his transitions and how he gets to certain places. He has got a hell of a good submission game to him. Yeah. No, absolutely true. He's, he even in his seven amateur fights, he won most of those by submission. He had more submissions than I ever thought of having just in his amateur career. Uh, he's he's a way slicker submission guy than I ever was, and and he may not have gone as high in the wrestling ranks, but I don't think that matters. He's still a very tenacious, good wrestler through junior high and high school, was third in the state uh, in Washington State his senior year. And he, he didn't do anything but just the scholastic season. He didn't wrestle in the summer. He didn't do freestyle. He didn't do Greco, all that other stuff that, that me and a lot of the other guys that go on to be on the national team and chase the Olympic thing do. He was just a very talented, good collegiate wrestler and could have went to college to wrestle at Portland State, he's like, Dad, I don't want to go to, I don't want to wrestle in school. That's I right. just want to go to school. And he went and got his degree in math. And I mean, he, he's a very, very smart kid. Well, the, you know, the one thing that MMA has really proven is, you know, the transition from wrestling into MMA is obviously that wrestling background helps guys, but the transition of wrestling titles does not transition into you being a better wrestler in an MMA match. Uh, you see guys all the time. Look at John Jones. John Jones had, you know, some credentials, but he didn't have the big time credentials. And he out wrestles everybody, yeah. and he's out wrestling Olympians. And you look at what you know George St. Pierre did. There's no really wrestling that like wrestling credentials in there. A hell of an MMA wrestler. You know, we don't get guys, you know, anymore. Ryan, his wrestling. If you're looking at what he's doing. He's wrestling as an MMA wrestler really at a high level. Yeah, and John, we talked uh, before the Bellator broadcast about Will Brooks, Bellator's lightweight world champion, did not wrestle in college, yet against Michael Chandler, who was the Division I All-American at Missouri. Chandler sometimes was losing the wrestling situations, wrestling yeah. for MMA situations. It's interesting because you hear that a lot. Well, this guy's a better wrestler in wrestling, yeah. but in wrestling for MMA, I have it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely correct. Look at what George St. Pierre did with Josh Koscheck, who's a three-time national champion in college. There, there's wrestling and that kind of wrestling that fits in the box that, that they, people score for collegiate championships and freestyle and Greco championships. And then there's wrestling that works. Misha Tate, Sarah McMahon, grabs her by the neck and sweeps her. If she'd have tried any other kind of more traditional wrestling move, Sarah probably would have smothered her and she'd have been stuck on the bottom, but she did something. It's still wrestling, but it, it's not in that box that would, that Sarah's used to. And, right. and it worked. That's everything that, you know, people are, they get into this, they try to force everything into that square box and that, well, this person's a better wrestler. It's like, you're not getting it. This isn't wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, this is everything. And, and it matters so much. If you took Josh Koscheck and you put him against George St. Pierre in a pure wrestling match, Josh, kept, Josh even today is going to smoke him. He's going to smoke him in a pure wrestling match, but this is not pure wrestling. And it's the way that you can transition from that stand up into wrestling positions, into wrestling holds, and how you do all that. That's what determines what level of wrestler you are in MMA. Randy, it's interesting how Art Davey was looking for wrestlers. The first one was Dan Severn at UFC 4, Arizona State All American Division 1. But a lot of wrestlers came in in the early days of the UFC under Art Davey did not have success. What do you think the reason was for you have you having success? I mean, there were others, Mark Coleman, obviously, Dan Severin, but you were almost Lord at the Christ, you know, Severin, But you were almost at the guys. forefront of that, kind of taking it to the next level. I know Coleman, and maybe rightly so, is seen as the father of ground and pound, but you even went beyond that. Why do you think your wrestling base worked in MMA when it didn't work for a lot of guys? I think two things. One, I had a 
particular wrestling skill in Greco at, at a high level that not a lot of other guys had. Uh, Danny Henderson, Matt Lindland, probably the only two other guys that had that much high-level Greco experience. And of the three styles of wrestling that we're talking about, I think Greco translates to mixed martial arts very, very well because of the infighting, the clinch fighting on the on the barrier, on the cage, the body lock stuff that we saw tonight with Elsie Davis and, and that Japanese kid. That's one of the best fights I've seen in a damn long time. And, 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 you know, even what Joe Warren did, you know, in, in his title fight tonight, that, that – body lock that he did, you're not going to see a lot of guys that can pull that off, that have the sensitivity in their bodies to do that from the clinch, from the body lock like that. But I think in my mind, it boils down to ego, being willing to realize you don't know it all, that, that wrestling is, is a great place to start, but you got to be willing to put yourself out there and then figure out how to plug wrestling into the situations that you're into in, in an MMA fight. It's different. And it's one of the things I loved about Neil Melanson as my ground coach, is we would get off on these tangents at practice, and the next thing you know, three hours had passed. And we're like, holy Christ, it's it's 7.30. We've been here since 4 o'clock. And we'd just get off, you know, talking about different wrestling techniques and moves uh, and how they fit into to ground fighting and, and being in fighting situations. And so I don't think I was so caught up in, oh, I'm this wrestler and, and got to prove that, you know, I knew I still had a ton of stuff to learn and was willing to put myself out there. You know, it, it's, it's amazing when you're looking at what you did and now what Ryan's doing. What, do you, what are you looking for out of Ryan being in Bellator? You know, this is his second fight in Bellator, right? Mm -hmm. Second win. And... They're already talking about that lightweight title. What do you think about that? I think, in, and I think he'll be the first one to tell you that he's, this is a tough division and he's got a long way to go. Uh, he wants to take it one fight at a time. He's not in a hurry. This is his deal, and this is what I was talking about, is I just try to stay the hell out of his way. He makes the decisions. I give him my honest opinion. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm, I'm going to tell him exactly what I think. You know, look at the Ross Pearson fight. Shouldn't, should, let's be honest, he had seven pro fights. He's fighting a guy that has 30. He shouldn't have been in that fight. Technically, tactically broke it down. I still thought he could have won the fight technically, and I think he showed that in the first round. But should he be fighting a guy that's got 30 pro fights? No, probably not. And, and uh, but at the end of the day, you know, he wants to take his time, and, and this is his career. I, I want to. If anything, it's a burden for him dragging around the same last name and having to deal with all the Absolutely. shit that he has to that he has to deal with, and he takes it all in stride. He's enjoying it. I see the work. I see the passion. I know he's doing what he loves to do, and that's all I really want. Well, of the three of us, I, I, I probably get the least. I certainly get the least. But I was talking to your son after our Bellator fighter interview. Uh, right after we left, you were getting hit up for photos and autographs. And I said to Ryan, you know, my nine-year-old daughter, Ellie, when I take her to fights, she sometimes has a tough time because everybody wants to come up and talk to her dad. That's the one place I'm recognized. The two of you are recognized everywhere. People want to take photos. They want to talk to me. They want autographs. It bothers her. And I asked Ryan, did that bother you as a kid? And he's got a really great attitude as it. It's difficult as a kid. And I'm sure it's difficult as a grown man trying to make your, your own name your own way in this sport. It, you know, I, I have an 11-year-old, Ryan's little brother, from my second marriage, and, and it, it does bother him. We'll be at the movie theater, and it's my time with him, which I don't get a lot of. So when somebody comes up to me at the movie theater and wants a picture or wants an autograph, I, I turn to him. He's like, that's okay, Dad, you know, because this is his time. And, and so it is, it is tough, tough on, especially on younger, younger kids uh, to understand. He don't get it. I'm just Dad. I don't, I don't, why is that guy, he doesn't get it at all. And I don't expect that he would. Um, Ryan's grew up in gyms, Ryan and Amy both. I mean, they've been at more gymnasiums than they, they certainly than they can remember. So, I mean, it, and it's different in wrestling. The wrestling world's a lot different than the fighting world. And I didn't have people coming up to me for autographs and all that when they were little as a wrestler. We're not, we were never that popular. It wasn't the same thing. It wasn't until I started fighting and made the transition to fighting that, that you know, people start freaking out and, and doing that. And he was already an adult. So he still rolls his eyes. He thinks it's funny, but it, it, it didn't have the same effect that it has on my 11-year-old who just, he just doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. And uh, 
I think they get it. I think it's a matter of they get tired of it. And it's understandable because it's hard on them because they're pushed to the side and dad's over there, you know, taking pictures. And then all of a sudden it's more than one picture and it's two and three. And now it's, you got a line going and they have to just sit there and wait. And it's not easy. It's, it's not an easy thing for kids. I had people used to, you know, I would go to the bathroom with my kid. I, you know, I would walk in the bathroom because I had people talking to my kids in the bathroom about, is that your dad? And it's, you look and you go, don't go and freaking start talking to my kid. You know, and it's, you have to do things different, but it's tough. And it's, it's good that you ask him, hey, is this okay? Because if it's not, you need to say, I'm sorry, I can't do it right now because it's a lose, beep, beep. lose. It is. But it's no. a lose, lose. If I say no, that person walks away and says, that guy's a fucking asshole. Yes, sir. And if I say yes, I'm taking away from my girlfriend, my kids, whoever it is I'm with, that I really need to and want to spend time with. So either way, I lose. And so actually putting it on them, and I learned this from Terry Crews. We're sitting at lunch with Terry during Expendables 1 in New Orleans, and he's got five kids and a wife that he's been with for over 20 years. And, and these people keep coming up to our table during lunch, and his kids and his wife are there. And I'm like, dude, how do you, I get that all the time. How do you deal with that? And he's like, oh, I just tell them. This is their time. So if it, if it was just me, I'd be happy to do it for you. But this is their time. I can't take away from their time. And now if they walk away pissed off, they look like the asshole. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense to me. Randy, I'm sure it's probably gotten even bigger now with your film career. You've almost, and I'm not even sure if you have the awareness, and John, I think you're in the same category. It's almost kind of that David Beckham category. I was oh, still a major league. No, and, and I say this. I, I was still a major league. <laughs> I don't have David Beckham's looks, and I don't have David Beckham's wife. All right. <laughs> I, I, I was still a major league soccer commentator. I was doing Pride in MLS when Beckham came into the league. And there were people who had never watched soccer in their life, and they knew who David Beckham was. And I think both of you have fallen, both of you have fallen into that category. Do, do you think a lot of that is the film career? Or I don't know, you've, you've always been very media friendly, and you're a genuinely nice person, but it seems to oh, me that really even... <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's grown, Randy. It really has, even after your fighting career. It seems like your, your fame, your celebrity has grown. I think, obviously, hardcore fight fans, I remember the first guy at, at Costco after I fought in the UFC the first time. He freaked out, melted down, ran up and bought nine disposable cameras in a pack <laughs> so he could pull one out and take a picture at the Costco. I mean, I was like, this is so weird. Uh, but that was still contained, I think, predominantly to the fights. I remember the first time we went to Japan and went to that Pancras show on Friday before the Saturday. Oh, that was bad. And what was it? <laughs> thank God we could see over all of them. <laughs> that was it. it was a sea of humanity mobbed us, uh, you know. But that's, again, a fight situation. And now, I think since 05 and, and the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, when, when we're, you know, he's refing fights and, and we're in front of a million people on any given night on television, not just on a pay-per-view, uh, that's when things really started to change. And uh, now obviously I'm getting recognized more, I'm getting you know, 50 and 60 year old women, I shouldn't say 50, cause I'm 51. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, 60 year old women that are running me down in the airport now because of Dancing with the Stars and getting more people that, from, from Expendables especially being involved in it. In Just like David Beckham. See, uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> that's that Dancing with the Stars. Victor Ortiz was on that too, right? I'm friends with Victor and he's, every time I'm out with him, it's the old lady say, you were on Dancing with Stars. I liked you, right? And it's like, you know, all of a sudden it starts in. It's like, there's way too many old women watching Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, 17 million of them. <laughs> Literally, they have a, viewing, a viewership for that show that's just ridiculous. It's insane. I got jumped by six ladies getting off a plane. Like, oh my God, you know. Did they know that you had fought or you were the guy they from Dancing no with the Stars? They had no idea. They just knew me from Dancing with the Stars. They weren't fight fans. You know, when you look at it, this is what, you know, the media does. And look at, there's people that know him for fighting. There's going to be women that know him for movies, guys that know him for movies, the Dancing with the Stars. Everything that you're, you know, out there doing, you're just opening things up to people understanding that, you know what? It doesn't matter about fighting or anything like that. It's what kind of person you are. And when you do those things, then they start to realize, oh, he was a fighter too. And then they start to say, oh, he was so nice. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Most fighters are really nice people. You're always gonna get the ones like anything. There's any kind of lifestyle, any kind of job, there's gonna be someone that they're a jerk at it. 
but most of the guys are very humble. They're very approachable. They're very easy to talk to. And, you know, when you get to the status that Randy's had, you know, you got to admit, you're up in that upper status. You well, know you're up in that upper Wonderful thing status. about our job, though, we do run across those jackasses, and we get to punch them in the face. <laughs> Randy, I, I've always thought part of your appeal, though, was the fact that you didn't start in MMA until you were in your 30s. 33. Yeah, 33. It, it wasn't, you know, like, like you would come out and you were an Olympian or you were making all this money or you already had fame. It, it was almost sort of a grassroots campaign. You probably weren't aware it was a grassroots campaign, but it was kind of, wow, here's this guy that I can really root for. You're not 265 pounds. You're not six foot six, but yet you were winning. You had this style, and I think it appealed to a lot of people. I think, yeah, the, the, the Advil crowd for sure could relate because I, I was always the underdog because of my age a lot of times, but almost from the very start of my career, from, from the, my second UFC in the Belfort fight with, with the you know, 20, 21, 22-year-old kid that's just killing everybody, and, and here I am, you know, 34, uh, by most people's estimation, already over the hill for combative sports. And and so I don't and I am that I am the guy next door in a lot of ways. So There's I think they could relate. Right, this is the Art Davies story here. See, because you go back to that. Because you know I was a fan of his when he was wrestling, because I was you know when I wrestled early and then Jeff Latin. It was I really got into Greco knowing Jeff, and so I started watching all the guys. And when all of a sudden they said you know, Randy Couture is going to I think Randy Couture is going to be in the show. I was like, Randy fucking Couture is going to be in the show. I said, dude, that's awesome. He's an awesome wrestler, right? And then he wins. He beats Tony Holm, who was going to tear his arms off of his body and beat him to death with him. I remember right. that. My beat mom cried. <laughs> she was at home watching it on TV, and that interview came on, and, and he was mad dogging the whole thing. And my mom literally started crying after that interview. That was it. He's gonna tear your arms off. Then he, then you had Stephen Graham, and you beat Stephen Graham, and he wins the. Yeah, he wins at the time. It wasn't the same title, but it was this medal they would give you. Was the the UFC, you know, heavyweight tournament winner. And in the next thing, Art Davies says, I'm going to put Couture against Vitor Belfort. And I go, why are you going to do that? That's the stupidest thing ever, right? Because Vitor has been, you know, ripping through people with fast hands and stuff. And he goes, well, what are you talking about? I said, dude, you have, and I hate to tell you this to your face. I said, you got a guy that can be a star in Randy Couture also. I go, give him time. He's not freaking up to par. He's a wrestler who's trying to learn this. You give him some time to learn. Give him six months and then make that fight give him you know a year and make that fight don't do that now you're going to take your heavyweight you know tournament winner and put him against a guy that's probably going to beat him and you know that was the way i felt about it at the time and and, and he goes oh, he's got a sink or swim right little fucking little art that little bastard <laughs> right and so I, I i looked at it well then you know comes the time of the fight and you know no one knows this but vitor calls me up to his room and you know and he, I could see he was, he was nervous, he was worried, he was scared. And, I'm, and he's asking me questions that I'm like, oh my God, you're gonna lose. And I'm thinking that to myself, I didn't say it to anybody. And then night of the fights, you know, he comes out, he's, how long were you standing out in that ring? 10, ten minutes? 10 minutes, minutes yeah. yeah. And you, know, you look at it, I go in the back, because in the back they had trailers, yes. they, had, they actually had motorhomes. Oh motorhomes that the guys were in, right? And I go on the back, and I, I knock on Vitor's thing, and they say, he's not feeling good. I say, yeah, I don't care, where is he? And they, you know, he's in the back, and as I get into the motorhome, and I walk to the back, and I said, and I knocked on the thing, Vitor, this is John. You have two minutes to get your butt out there, or I'm saying you're disqualified. He wins by forfeit, right? And you know, he came down, I came running back, and all of a sudden he's coming down, and I knew. I said, you know, it's one of those ones you go, Oh, this is going to shock everyone because this kid doesn't have a chance. His mind was just blown. He was so worried about what he was going to do, what Randy was going to do. It was like mind blowing to me at the time. So I'm like, I know a secret that no one knows, and it's, it's going to happen. And it happened, you know, it went that way. And I knew that fight as a fan. I wasn't yet a commentator in this sport, but Vitor Belfort really, I thought, was being portrayed. A lot of it was Art Davy is the Mike Tyson of MMA. He's unbeatable, he's a phenom, he's young and he's only going to get better, and there you go. Yeah, absolutely true. And he certainly had my, my attention because UFC 13, he, he spanked Tank in 60 seconds. It was brutal, it was brutal. Just blasted through him, and, uh, and they're like, oh, well, they want you to fight that guy next, and, and I'm looking at Rico going, really? 
and he's like, oh, and, he, and we broke it down and we looked at the film and talked about it and, and I just, I got a boxing coach right away. I thought, I gotta learn how to box. This kid's gonna knock my damn head off. And uh, looked at what everybody else had done and how they ended up getting caught and getting blown through and realized none of them were moving. They were all standing right in front of him. And he started every combination with a straight left. He's explosive as hell. But they're all standing there to catch it right in the face. And it started learning how to circle and learn. I look at some of that old boxing footage and it, oh, it was so pitiful. <laughs> God, it was so bad, but it was, it was what it was. But that little bit of footwork and, and, and I knew if I got my hands on him, I was gonna be okay. And I could make him work. And I didn't, he'd only gone two minutes, I think, was the longest fight he'd had to that point. I knew if I could get him out there three, four, five minutes, odds were going way up for me. Uh, that, that he wasn't going to he, he wasn't going to be able to operate. And yeah. I mean, and, you know, at the time you you look at the the age and say, oh, he was young. And that was actually you know one of his downfalls at the time was he was so young that emotionally and you know mentally he wasn't strong at that time. He's a, he's a completely different person now, a completely different fighter now. You look at him, he's turned into this man that you know what who now understands the fight game. He understands what's in, what's important and what's not. And you look at the way he does it, he does things completely different. But back then, everyone had put him up on this pedestal. And, you know, it was, it's understandable. He blew through, you know, his one fight in Super Brawl, I think, was 11 seconds. And then he had, you know, you know Trey Telegman, then Scott Ferrozo, then Tank Abbott. And he had blown through them all. And so everyone was, dude, he was anointed as the phenom. Yeah, the Tank Abbott yeah. fight was when I thought, wow, who's going to beat this guy? Yeah, and, you know, it was, you know, I think that was, you know, the perfect fight now that you look back. Art Davey was right. I hate saying he was right. But he was right in the fact that, you know what, he put a mentally strong person at the time with good wrestling skills against the guy who physically was an incredible athlete, but at that point in his life wasn't prepared for that fight. Randy, I commented the last Pride, which was eight years ago, April. So we're, we're recording this in, in, in March, but a lot of people are going to be listening in April. But it was, it was April 2007. Wow. It's amazing how much the sport has changed. It's almost, John and I were talking about this last night. It's almost like when you, you see those NFL games, those old grainy black and whites from the 30s and 40s with the leather helmets. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how fast this sport has moved. If you watch NFL now from 2007, it really doesn't look that different. Baseball looks exactly the same. Baseball looks the same from 1987. Isn't it crazy, though, how much the sport has changed in 2007, let alone early 2000s, late 90s? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, even just to go to the weigh-ins is, is a whole different animal and a whole different thing. My first weigh-ins were in the lobby at the Holiday Inn in, <laughs> in Augusta, Georgia. And I had not seen anybody that was fighting that night. I didn't know a single person. It wasn't like I could go look up footage and figure out who they were or what they did. I would never seen any of them until we stepped on the scale to check our weights in the lobby at the Holiday Inn. And I'm like, holy shit, that guy's big. What did I get myself into? I'm, I may have made a bad decision here, uh, but it, it was a whole different thing. And I think there was 1,500, maybe 2,000 people in the Civic Center. Most of the tickets were given away to get people in the stands so it looked like there was a crowd there. And they didn't care. They didn't know who was fighting. They didn't know a single guy on that poster. There was very few of them that knew what was going on. They wanted to see fights. And there were more fights in the stands that night than there were in the damn cage. It was it was a whole different deal. It was so That's much it. fun. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see as the biggest change, though, from when you started? Even we're talking about eight years ago with Pride. For me, personally, it's the weight cuts. I think that's the biggest difference in the sport. The weight cuts? In terms of guys are walking around 30 pounds heavier than their fighting weight. I don't even think we, we saw that. We certainly didn't see it in Pride. When I was in M1 in 2008, 2009, we didn't even really see it then. To me, that's a really recent phenomenon in the last four or five years where a guy who's fighting at 55 is walking around at 80, 80, 185 pounds. I guess I always knew there was some weight cutting. I mean, back then, there were only two. I mean, UFC 13 was the right. first two weight class tournament. Over and under 200 Lightweight pounds. and heavyweight. <laughs> Anything under 200, yeah, was a lightweight. And... Uh, 
and obviously as we've implemented more and more weight classes there's always going to be that mentality and it's a frankly a wrestler's mentality that oh if i'm tough at 170 imagine what i'd do at 155 and it's not always the case it's not always accurate no, it's not it's uh, not accurate it's good and the one thing the weight cutting is going to be an issue in the future it's going to be something that's going to change mm-hmm. you know let me ask you this what do you think is if there was one thing that you could change in mma what would it be well i, I mean that that's a loaded question totally because, loaded that's why i'm asking <laughs> it i mean because there's a whole bunch of fighter issues certainly you always know when you when a guy cut weight right or cut weight wrong and i don't know that we have a huge issue in weight cutting as far as people's health um a ton of other issues we talked you start opening the can of worms and talking about a, a guild or a union and fighter issues and fighter pay and and no retirement no 401k no health insurance all these things that that fighters yeah if you got hurt tonight in the show Sure, it's going to be taken care of. But how about last week when you're getting ready? That you're you're screwed unless you know. I'm fortunate enough that I formed a corporation and I'm able to get health insurance for my key employees and myself through my corporation. There's not a lot of other fighters that that have that that sense to do that. And uh, so there are a ton of fighter issues that are things that I would love to see changed in the sport. As far as weight cutting, yeah, I think you know guys can get carried away and. It's about having that coach, having having that team around you that say, man, why would you want to do that? You're killing yourself. It's about technique and mindset and going out there and doing what you, what you can do. And you're not going to be any better at, at 135 than you were at 145. So it's going to be worse. This, this is where the, if there was one thing that I could change right now, I would make it to where every, every fighter in, during their medicals, they have to do exactly what an NC2A wrestler has to do. They have to have a hydrostatic test. Mm-hmm to say, you cannot go below this weight. This is the lowest that you can go. And on top of that, when they weigh in, they have to weigh in again after the fight. Ohio does that. And it's, look, what people don't understand is when fighters are losing weight, they're sucking the water out of their system, but people aren't thinking about what the real problem is. The real problem is if you go back the last 25 years, the heaviest hitters in the world are heavyweights, but they do not suffer subdural hematomas. Lightweight fly- fighters do, and the reason they do is because they are sucking so much water out of their system, they're losing so much weight to try to make a specific weight, and then they're trying to flush their body with fluids to put it back. Well, the cells don't come back the same, and when they don't come back the same, you have certain things that occur in your skull, your brain starts to shrink. It's water. It's made of a lot of water. And it has a lining called the dura that sits between the skull and the, and the brain. And that sits on top of the brain. And when the brain gets a small cut, that dura cauterizes it. It has pressure on it. But when your brain shrinks because you lost so much fluids, it pulls away from the dura. And now it can't do what it's supposed to do as far as helping cauterize. And we end up having fighters that get seriously hurt and have problems. And we're also getting fighters that are dying during the weight cut. Look at this is a sport and we want them to be as safe as possible and to have guys that are losing so much weight that it's affecting them in the fight. When you see fighters and you have fans saying, he's not in shape, you're nuts, that dude's in shape. His body is shutting down because he lost too much weight. And that's the biggest issue I see and it's what really needs to change in the sport. Well, I think a big piece of that can be can be taken care of with educating a fighter and and having a good team of guys around him that know when he's doing things. I know when it, when I did it right in wrestling, and I knew when I did it wrong because I felt like crap and I didn't compete well. Uh, I cut some weight in in fighting too, but it's never more than ten or twelve pounds. And if you look at the percentage of my body weight at two hundred and five to two hundred and twenty, it, it's within a normal realm. I lose in a normal practice, a normal two hour practice, I lose seven to nine pounds of water. So if I'm within seven or nine pounds, I, my body's used to purging that and putting that back in every single day I train. And, and if you're cutting 12, 14, 18 pounds to make weight, you're cutting way too much weight and you are not going to, you are not going to perform. Randy, last thing we want to talk to you about, it's been great having you on Let's Get It On. It's really a pleasure to have you on. We've had Victor Ortiz. 
and Randy Couture. So we need more people from Dancing with the Stars. Ron in here. Get Kellen. Get get get. You know Stallone. That's what I need. I need. We gotta get Sly on the fucking show. Sly, make that call. <laughs> Let's talk about the projects you have going on, entertainment with your gym, just everything going on with you. Obviously, the gym's doing very, very well. Uh, we've got Robert Follis in there running pro practices, Dennis Davis. That They work together, both guys that I knew from Team Quest days back in Oregon, and uh, Dennis has been with me for a while. He's running the amateur team. The, the team's really thriving and, and doing very, very well in the environment there. Eric Nixick is our new gym manager and just a great guy, very gregarious and, and very in tune with everything going on there. Uh, so the gym's doing well. Obviously, Ryan uh, firing on all cylinders right now and, and doing great as well. Um, for me, I've been plugging away, trying to produce and make more content instead of waiting for this film or going and reading for that film. Uh, we're in the pitching process for a TV series right now. CBS signed on to produce the show, which gives us a lot of gas going into these uh, network meetings and trying to figure out where it's going to air. And it's called The Grappler. Uh, 1905 catches catch can wrestling in the Marin County Fair in, in San Francisco. A uh, very boardwalk empire-ish, kind of gritty, dirty. Frisco was a very interesting place at that time. Uh, of 400,000 people that lived in San Francisco. The, the, the gold rush in, in California had just come to an end and the Yukon gold rush was just tearing up and, and it was the biggest port city on the West Coast at that time. So a lot of stuff happening and, and a very, I, I'm very excited about it. I think it's good for wrestling, good for, for grappling and MMA because I, I, I stopped thinking about jiu-jitsu about six, seven years ago and started getting back into those wrestlers' eyes. Uh, you know, I looked at my loss with, with Josh Barnett and thought, what the fuck was I thinking? Pulling guard, the guy's 255 pounds. Why do I want to be under there? And and uh, started, play, you know, thinking more about wrestling. And, and Neil Melanson helped me a ton kind of tap into And I started getting way more submissions when I stopped playing the guard game. I was never going to be that guy. I was never going to catch up to those guys that play that game. But uh, so catch wrestling was something that, all the same rules apply, the same holds, all, all, they did all that stuff and it was real. It's a precursor to what we know as pro wrestling now and and collegiate wrestling grew out of catches, catch can wrestling and wrestling rules. Uh, so I'm excited about that project. Randy, great having you on the program, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being on, brother. <laughs> Always a pleasure. The Natural, Randy Couture recorded immediately following Bellator 135 at Windstar World Casino and Resort in Thackerville, Oklahoma. We're back with you next week for a new episode of Let's Get It On, first available on Friday. Download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. You can also find us on social media, facebook.com slash let's get it on podcast. Please be sure and give us a like. And we're on Twitter at podcast MMA for this show. And for us personally at John McCarthy MMA and at Sean Wheelock to ask us a question, make a comment or inquire about becoming a sponsor of let's get it on email us at info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, that's info at let's get it on podcast.com. And please help us spread the word about this podcast in any way that you can. We want this to be your show as much as it is ours. For Randy Couture, John McCarthy, and our producer, Chris Lakin, I'm Sean Wheelock. A genuine thank you to everyone for listening. This has been a presentation of Ignotainment Media Network online at ignotainment.com. Let's get it on with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock, only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in the comments section of the iTunes Podcast Store. If you have questions, comments, or are interested in sponsoring the show, contact us at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com or check out our additional lineup of podcasts, including Ocho Man, Behind the Eight Ball, The Whiskey Philosopher, and Youth Baseball Talk at Ignotainment.com.